Good evening and welcome to the inaugural meeting of the Housing and Community Safety Policy and Scrutiny Committee. Um, as we are a new committee and there are some new members, we'll quickly go around the table uh, just to introduce ourselves to everybody both here and watching knows who we are. It's on my left. I'm Chris Elliott. I'm the Democracy Officer for this Scrutiny Committee. Uh, I'm Andrew Hoyer. I'm subbing for uh, Councillor Ashley Mason. I'm Councillor Christian Vassi. I'm representing Wildrake Ward. Councillor Rosie Baker for Micklegate. Um, Tom Britton, Assistant Director for Community Safety. Margaret Wells, Councillor for Clifton. Ashley Wilson, Councillor for Hull Road. Michael Pavlovic, another councillor for Hull Road. Dawn Steele, head of Civic Democratic Services. Uh, David McLean, uh, scrutiny officer for this committee. You were familiar with the technology. Now, I'm familiar with the technology. Um, during the meeting, if you want to... Um, uh, take part in the debate or raise a, uh, make a comment, indicate to me and I'll, I'll bring you in and make sure you turn your mic on. But we, you seem all very well trained in the last previous um, committees. I think some councillors struggled a bit with the, the button pressing, but you seem to have mastered it. Um, I'll start with any declarations of interest. Um, if anyone can declare any interest that are not already on your um, standing declarations. No? Thank you very much. Um, I'm hoping that we will finish the meeting by 7 o'clock. I know some members have other places to be, so we'll try, try and keep the uh, discussion, uh, discussion going at a, at a pace. Um, the meeting is being webcast, um, just to make everybody aware. You'll find on the table an, <clears throat> an additional paper. Uh, this is... The beginning of this additional paper is the same um, as that which begins at page 23 in your published pack. Um, there's some additional information in this paper that wasn't, or it wasn't published um, in, the, in the papers when they were distributed. Uh, but Tom will mention that when he, when he speaks, but just to make you aware that that's what the additional paper is for. Okay, we, as Councillor Hollier mentioned, Councillor Hollier is subbing for Councillor Mason, who sent his apologies. Uh, that's all the apologies we have. Um, so with that, no further ado, if I hand over to Dawn. To... No public participation. No public participation? No. Public no. Participation. Okay. Um, agenda item three, arrangements for scrutiny in York. Yes. Dawn. Yeah, this was just um, to give, largely speaking in the main, it's for the benefit of new members to scrutiny and as well as new members to this committee. Um, and it's a report that all the scrutiny committees have received this time around, which basically looks at overviewing the terms of reference of all the scrutiny committees, including this one, which, as the chair earlier said, is, is a new one. Um, it looks at the key principles for effective scrutiny, so the good things you should be doing to be an effective scrutineer and an effective scrutiny committee. Um, and it looks at um, the various arms of scrutiny and the roles of scrutiny. A lot of you will be familiar with holding the executive to account, challenging people. Um, but part of that challenge is, is also to be a critical friend, so the policy development side of scrutiny committee, etc. It looks as well at um, work planning. Um, one of the things that I just wanted to refer to as part of covering this particular item, um, when it talks about work planning, it, it, it says, it tells you how important it is to look at your work plan. Set, set yourself um, reasonable and achievable targets and priorities that you know you've got the resources to, to complete, basically. Um, but one thing that, um, and the chair will remember, um, one thing that scrutiny did last year, um, the main overarching corporate scrutiny committee uh, took on a review looking at scrutiny operations. As part of that, it looked at work planning. Um, so we have this year set off um, 
excuse me, a new set of arrangements whereby directors, directorates are asked by council to engage with their scrutiny chairs and vice chairs in relation to work planning. You'll have seen an email, Christian. Um, Councillor Fentel received an email um, that asks directorates to do that so that scrutiny committees can get um, immediate help, if you like, with assessing what priorities the council has as well as what priorities you might have as a committee, etc. So that's a change. Look for that to be happening during the year. Um, we've also set up an arrangement with the endorsement of council for um, briefings to be given to scrutiny committees as you consider embark embarking on new topics and key subjects as you move forward. Are you fully au fait with the issues? You know, do you fully understand the issues around that specific topic? Um, and actually what we've looked at is putting in a set of factual briefings when we know what those issues are with the help of the committees and the directorates, etc. And that's something my colleague Chris will be arranging um, as the person in my team responsible for putting um, training together. So it was just to say, Chair, happy to answer any questions on the report, but those are all the reasons why that report is here, is to give you a, a helping hand right at the outset and the onset of the year. Um, that doesn't preclude talking to any of us as, as part of the scrutiny team, obviously, the, to offer help if you want help and guidance. On the scrutiny and policy arrangements. I think just, sorry, Michael. Yeah. Thank you. No, <clears throat> I'd second that. And I think, the, I think the key thing I took from it is there's been discussion in in previous years about how, as well as scrutinising things that have happened, we can inform policy formation as it, um, as it evolves. And I think <clears throat> we need to use the opportunity that we have with this, this refresh to make sure that as a scrutiny and policy committee, we don't forget the policy bit. Um, and I think we've got an opportunity to... Um, to to, to be ahead of the game in, in, in some senses and, and key to that will be looking at the decisions that are on the, the council's forward plan so that sets out all the issues that are going to be coming to the executive for decision um, and working with, um, <clears throat> with Michael and, um, and David we'll look ahead and see what decisions are coming that, that relate to, to this service area uh, and working with, with officers make sure that now we're meeting monthly, and that again is a, is a change from what we've had previously. We do have the opportunity, even if it's not to receive a fully formed proposal, but to at least get the bare bones so we can have a discussion uh, and, and input our suggestions and our ideas uh, to that work going forward. So I'm keen that we we focus on policy as much as, as scrutiny, uh, which hopefully will make it more um, interesting and, and rewarding for, for all of us rather than simply looking backwards all the time. <laughs> okay, um, if there's no further uh, questions for Dawn, thank you very much and you're excused. Thank you. Okay, um, agenda item four, attendance of Assistant Director for Housing and Safer Neighbourhoods. Um, this is an overview of um, essentially of the policy areas. I asked um, Tom to bring this report primarily to enable all of us to have a, a, an understanding of the, the service areas that we are responsible for scrutiny and, and policy development for. So um, I think what Tom has produced kind of hits the nail on the head in that sense. So thank you for, for doing that. At the end of Tom's um, presentation, and I'll... We'll pause at intervals to, to take questions and comments. Um, <clears throat> we as a group can have a discussion uh, and try and identify some areas where we think either from a policy development perspective or a scrutiny perspective, there are issues where we might as a group want to do some, some further work, either as an agenda item at a future meeting or potentially as a scrutiny topic. So I would ask as we're going through, if you things occur to you that you think yeah, that looks like an area where I would like to um, to do some more work. Just make a note of it, and then once we've all got our lists, we can have a discussion at the end as to 
not just what we want to come to the next meeting, but in the longer term, what topics we might want to look at from a, a scrutiny perspective. Um, so with that, I'll hand over to Tom. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, well, welcome to you all um, in terms of this new uh, scrutiny committee. Um, it's quite timely in the sense that uh, you're joining the world of housing and community safety at a very exciting time. There's a lot of things going on at the moment, um, significant investment both in new housing and our existing council stock, um, also major programmes around ICT, um, all of which will um, obviously modernise the service um, and bring it into the 21st century. Um, the ICT programme is a, a programme of 2.1 million and is intended to bring our existing systems into the 21st century because they still run on steam at the moment and uh, they, uh, uh, we've got 25 systems in housing services alone, none of them which talk to each other. Um, so the intention is to replace that with one system. Um, so that's a programme that's just, we've just let the contract. Um, more widely, um, the department is made up of, I suppose, at the moment, five key areas. There's building services, housing services, the housing delivery team, the older person's accommodation team, and then there's the ICT programme. There's just under 300 people in the department. Um, oh, sorry, and community safety, I forgot that. Um, there's just under 300 people in the department as a whole, so the department is one of the largest uh, in the council. I think it's second only, really, to uh, uh, adult social care now. So it's a significant part of the council's uh, business. Um, unlike some areas of the council where they've seen cuts in the services, um, uh, the housing and community safety team has grown quite significantly over the recent years, and maybe I'll explain a bit of that later. Um, the way in which the, de the department is funded is different from most other parts of the council. Uh, most parts of the council are funded through what is called general fund or council tax. Um, a significant proportion of the department in housing and community safety is funded from what is called the housing revenue account or HRA, which is council tenant rent money. Um, unlike the council tax and general fund activities, we, are, we have not been under the same pressure in terms of cuts from central government. In fact, the housing revenue account, because the council has retained its stock and, and has invested in its, its stock on a consistent basis for the last 30 years, the stock is in reasonable condition generally, and also um, the H housing revenue account Forgive me if I use acronyms, but by all means, pull me up. I will pull other people up. Um, but the housing revenue account is in, turns a surplus every year, and so we are not under the same sort of pressure. We are able to invest that, reinvest that money in new housing. So, in terms of a bit more detail, obviously you'll have had the first version of this report which obviously excluded about nine pages, um, which uh, um, was significant. I, I'll go through those nine pages in a bit more detail than I would do in the other areas. What I intend to do is try and um, run through stuff fairly sh quickly, um, but maybe highlight some of the key things that are coming up in the next 12 months, rather yeah. than dwell on what's happened. Yeah, I think um, if, if you... If you for example, building services give an overview of key issues going forward, then we'll pause okay. after each section just to give people a chance to raise any comments or questions. Okay. So building services, um, uh, you've obviously got the details about it being split between a sort of reactive service and a capital program service, which is about more uh, planned work around modernisation of homes, placement of windows, etc., etc. 
Um, and within the next 12 months, you've got some details around what we're doing in, in various areas. Uh, um, in terms of some of the key progr planned programs, we've got the Tenants' Choice Modernisation Program. We've got this program to uh, deal with um, properties that have standing water underneath their, 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 their um, uh, ground floor. Um, which is all to do with York's high water table. Um, uh, so the water rises until it gets to the joists on the ground floor and then rots the ground floor. We're looking to do something that will resolve that more permanently by putting pumps in and things like that. Um, and then we're replacing the uh, heating systems. Um, I guess, I guess within this area, one of the key things that will co be coming out from this is that we've just co we've commissioned a stock condition survey. That's the first one that we've con we, we, we've done since 2002. So we're expecting that to throw up some po potential surprises in terms of uh, the stock and maybe some challenges in terms of what what we have to deal with there. Um, I think um, uh, this area as a whole is one that is obviously got planned programs of work and things like that. So in terms of scrutiny, I, I would suggest if there was anything there that you wanted to look at, it may be around the customer services standards, around repairs, etc. Um, on community safety, um, the community safety team. Sorry, Tom, can we, if we just oh, <coughs> sorry, yes. pause, um, pause of building services. Was there anything in the information in the report that anybody wanted to ask a question on or make an observation on, Councillor Vassley? Thank you. Yes, uh, I've obviously just taken my seat here after eight years off, so I've got a lot of catching up to do. Um, I'm, I noticed in the key issues going forwards. There are all sorts of uh, issues relating to repairs. Are these informed uh, by environmental strategy and policies? Uh, how does, for example, new heating systems, uh, tenants' choice, uh, new windows fitted respond to environmental uh, sustainability, insulation, renewable energy, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? As a as I alluded to at the start, um, the council's consistently invested in its housing stock uh, over the years, and um, in terms of sustainable issues, uh, the energy rating on council stock is high, the highest in the city compared to the rest of the stock in the city. So, the SAP rating, uh, which is the way in which you judge in, uh, on council stock, is running at 74, and that's top quarter of in. In, in the country. Um, that doesn't mean that we can't do more. Um, that doesn't mean that this is, that is not an issue that you might want to explore in terms of how you might want to influence the way in which the council have moved forward with its uh, capital programme. The capital programme is broadly speaking dictated by um, trying to achieve decency standards, which is something that the previous Labour government introduced but then has historically been eroded by successive governments since so that there isn't a standard, national standard for authorities but we still use that decency standard um, and that is used to judge when certain properties require or potentially require replacement kitchens, bathrooms, rewiring, things like that. And so each of those components tend to have a t lifespan to meet decency. So I can't remember off the top of my head, but I think the kitchens are 20 years lifespan. Um, and so we would look at that. Obviously, when we go and do the su surveying of properties, some people have maintained their properties at higher standard than others. Um, and, and they may not require replacement, but those sort of are the sort of things that we use to try and dictate how we... Um, go in and replace things. As far as the window replacement program is concerned, all, uh, as far as I'm aware, all of our windows have had double glazing put in, um, and uh, um, so then there's other programs like roofing, etc. 
we've done a, a range of programs around insulation across the city, both cavity wall and loft insulation. Like I say, the SAP rating in the, in, on council stock is higher than any other parts of the council uh, parts of the city's housing stock. Okay. <clears throat> any other comments on Councillor Pavlovich? Thank you, Chair. In respect to the stock condition survey, how is that progressing? Um, will it include all council-owned properties? Um, and what are your concerns if it, if it brings up a whole heap of issues that you hadn't already um, planned for in respect to the workforce and, um, and planning? Okay, so in terms of the stock condition survey, it is based on the 10% survey of our housing stock. It's, we're, not in, we're not inspecting all of it. And so from that, we'll be able to uh, determine some of the issues around the homes in terms of their components and whether there are particular areas of concern. Um, I don't know exactly what it might throw up. I mean, I think that we may find that, that we, we have... Um, we have more properties that maybe don't meet decency than we initially thought, and therefore it may be that we need to revise the program. If we need to revise the program, that will be informed by the review of the housing revenue account business plan, which is due to be d looked at later in the year, which is, uh, is basically the housing department is run like a business. It has its own business plan to determine where it wants to invest the money. Um, if we have to invest more money in our existing stock, then potentially there may be uh, issues around whether we have to slow down the delivery of, of new housing using our investment pro, or we may have to just schedule the work in over a more phased period. Okay. okay. Councillor Baker. Thanks. Um, I, when I read the current statistic for the customer satisfaction, um, which, which was meeting the national benchmark, so I read that as, well, it is one of your achievements, um, thinking, oh, well, that's something that you might not be looking to work further on, but you did say that perhaps it would be something we could scrutinise. So I'm, is it a scrutiny question on sort of the administration of that survey or how better to do that survey perhaps rather than an improvement to the result? I think, I think, I think achieving 80% is, is not bad in terms of customer service. Um, however, um, it is an issue, uh, repairs, we do get complaints. Um, you know, we are doing 30,000 jobs a year, so we're inevitably going to get some complaints. Um, I think there are some issues, if I'm honest, that there, there, there are some difficulties sometimes with more complex repairs that in, in terms of the speed at which they're done. And um, uh, uh, I would, it would be disingenuous to suggest that I don't think I think there is, there are issues around that element of the service in terms of people who um, have not had a good experience. Um, I think it will be better. It will, we will be making significant strides forwards once the new IT is in, because when. Over the next 18 months, we'll be putting the IT in, and part of that will be that tenants can order repairs themselves without even speaking to us. Um, obviously, they won't be allowed to order a brand new kitchen, <laughs> but they will be allowed to order uh, some basic repairs that um, are up to a certain value. So, and the, the experience that they will have there will be a bit like uh, an Amazon experience in the sense that they'll be told that the when they place the order, they'll be told it's been placed, they'll be told who's coming to do the work, they'll be told roughly when it's going to happen, and then there'll be text on the day of, or the day before advising them that they've got someone coming tomorrow. So the idea of the system is that it's more interactive and more intuitive, so that the customer actually is better informed throughout, because quite often the problems around customer service are obviously, I, I mean, Stating that the obvious is around better communication. Mm. Uh, 
So keeping the customer better informed should improve that. Um, but I think it's an issue that it, an issue that is worth considering, not just in terms of how housing repairs, but you know you could argue across the piece in terms of looking at. Uh, it's not necessarily a policy thing, but looking at complaints generally within the service is a way of informing how you could improve your service. Um, and you know later on in the report we talk about the various tenants groups that we have, and that maybe it may be worth inviting them to the meeting to get the other side, mm -hmm. rather than listen to me go tell you how wonderful I am. <laughs> okay, um, shall we move on to community safety? Okay. So as far as community safety is concerned, um, I think uh, this sometimes is quite, is a bit of a misunderstood area. Um, you know, uh, I think people think about community safety, you probably think about police, etc., etc. This is this is a softer element of, of the council's business in terms of the, the issues around uh, safety in the city. Uh, the work of the team is partly governed by the, the uh, uh, community safety strategy, and in the report you've got the key areas that are in there in terms of. Uh, uh, the different elements that we headline, so keeping the city centre safe, counter-terrorism, protecting people from harm, improving the quality of life through multi-agency approach, tackling serious organised crime and reducing offending, re-offending and tackling substance misuse. So those are the headings and there are action plans behind that in terms of the community safety team. I think the, only, the, the main things I'd like to just highlight here are particularly around the current issues that we're facing um, um, uh, that, that may be our areas that you may want to look at. One is county lines. Um, I don't know, are people familiar with what I mean by county lines? Um, uh, that is a very current issue in the city and um, uh, that we've had a number of recent cases um, most recently, with a, a gang from Manchester moved into an area of the city and has caused havoc. And it tends to be in, I wouldn't say universally, but it's quite often in areas where there is council housing stock. Um, these group gangs come in, they prey on vulnerable people in the community, they move into their homes, then they use their home as a sort of hub to distribute the drugs. That's a a, a, an area uh, of issue and concern. I think um, pe if people think that that um, this is something that won't come to York, it it is in York, and uh, um, uh, and it's an ongoing concern for for us, particularly in the police and within the community safety team. Other areas that. Um, are quite current is around modern slavery and exploitation. The, the team has been working closely with our private sector housing team and the, the, the extended licensing arrangements for houses in multiple occupation has thrown up some, a number of issues around um, people who are on very low wages potentially cleaning cars at Sainsbury's car park, etc., etc., but also living in very poor housing conditions. And we've gone in there and, and had to inspect those properties and identified other issues that, that we suspect are to do with modern slavery or exploitation. So the teams are work, working closely together to try and tackle some of those issues. And the other key area for the city in terms of... Um, Community safety is the whole issue around counter-terrorism. Uh, York is um, one of the most uh, visited cities in, in, in the country and uh, there is, the, 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 uh, there is a, a, a building in the city that is considered tier one priority, which is the Minster, um, and therefore there is some significant interest with the police and the counter-terrorist team about how we manage 
the city centre in that sense. So those are three of the key current issues for the team. The report itself describes the other types yeah. of work, but I won't go into that. Any members have any points they want to raise on the back of the community safety element of the report? No. I think the only comment I would make is that it, um, the community safety hub based in West Offices, I think it, it, it's never been that visible to members in terms of, I know they're there, but I'm not altogether sure who's involved and what they're doing. And it, there's obviously a lot going on. Um, and it, it may be useful for members of this committee to have a um, either go and meet the team or have a, a, a bit of a little briefing session to understand how they're all connected, the police, the um, council officers and others. Because there's obviously a lot of good work being done, but there probably isn't a, a lot of visibility within um, among members as to what, what they're doing. I think I think we could the team could always come here, but I think you're right. In some ways it would be better for you to go out with a neighbourhood enforcement officer and then show you around the the less delightful areas of the city centre where uh, you may get some clearer idea about the type of work that they're doing and the way in which they link in with uh, rough sleeping and resettlement, uh, the way in which they link in with the bid and uh, make it York. Um, equally, there may be some some merit in, uh, in going out with the antisocial behaviour team on some of the individual cases. Yeah. but. I think you get a better idea of what that team does. I mean, some of the stuff I've talked about is a lot of it is dealt with at a management level in the sense that it's part of the community safety manager's role to try and enable some of this stuff to happen around counter-terrorism and uh, uh, county lines rather than delivering a specific area of service. So a lot of the work that this team does is around enabling and about bringing people together, bringing the police and other partners together to tackle wider issues such as river safety, etc. Okay. Um, yeah. uh, is that an action for uh, me to uh, liaise with uh, Tom to explore some opportunities? Yeah. I, th I think if, if members would find it useful even to have the opportunity to, to, to shadow mm. or accompany a, an officer, particularly maybe picking an area that's of particular interest to you, either geographically or um, in terms of a topic, um, might help us to get a better understanding of, of the work that, the, that they do. I know I would probably find it quite interesting. Well done. Okay. If members are particularly keen, we can always have them go out on Saturday night on the noise <laughs> patrol at three in the morning. And... Yeah, good for that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Moving on, older persons accommodation program. Right. Okay. <clears throat> so, this is an area that's fairly recently come into my responsibility. A lot of the work relates to adult social care, and was a program that was first started as a consequence of the need to tackle some of the issues around accommodation for older people in the city and uh, the fact that a number of our residential care homes were getting to a point where they weren't fit for purpose anymore. So the first part of the programme was about closing down all our residential care homes except Haxby Hall. That has been achieved. Um, the, the key elements within this that I would like to highlight to you is that obviously we've got, we've got building works going on or, or new build going on in uh, several areas at the moment. Marjorie Wake Court in Clifton. Um, we've got the extension to that independent living scheme that we will create as an extra care scheme along similar lines to the work that happened at Glen Lodge. And then we've got Lincoln Court in uh, uh, Westfield Ward that has been uh, extended and improved. Uh, it's a 1960s building that was not really fit for purpose and was attached to a residential care home. The only problem is that the residential care home was being knocked down 
but the boiler served both buildings, so we had to do something about the Lincoln Court building. Um, so we've looked to um, extend that particular building. There are several others elements to the programme at the moment. Haxby Hall is a residential care home that is, will be refurbished and, and extended. Um, uh, and, but, so that, that is in the programme at the moment. And then there are a, re a residential care home being, going to be built at Burnholm site and also at the Lowfield site. Um, the, the contract for the Burnholm site has been uh, agreed. The, link, the, the Lowfield site, we have not commissioned that yet. Um, so there's a quite a, li a big programme of our own, but this, pro this, this work is also about looking at the wider issues about older persons accommodation across the city, not just looking at the bricks and mortar, but lo also looking at assisted technology and how that might support people in their own homes rather than have people having to move into uh, uh, more supported housing. So we particularly need to uh, uh, grasp the whole issue around the digital uh, uh, program there because there's a lot of things that can be done to assist people staying in their own homes. Um, it's also about looking at what's needed, not just in terms of council uh, 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 housing for older people but also the wider options for people generally in the city um, and I guess one of the things that you may want to consider looking at in scrutiny is that Vicky Japes the group manager for this area We'll be bringing a report to exec in probably a September, October time that will be exploring what the city's needs are. Um, the, the current programme that's been going forward was largely based on national picture. We are looking to do a piece of work over the next few months that identifies what the needs are for the city rather than just except the national picture around ageing population, da 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 da, da. Um, So that's um, a particular area that I would have thought is quite a meaty subject that members might want to be engaged with. So would that, <clears throat> would that in terms of policy development, would that be something we could bring to the next meeting of this committee to have a, if the officer were available, to have a discussion around the work she's doing and, and to give her our input? Um, certainly if the officer is available, um, uh, I think we can bring something back here. It won't be the finished article, but then again, as Stephen, we've talked about, it, I think, you know, if you want to influence stuff that's going forward, then mm. sometimes you might need to accept that the, what comes to you is a bit rough around the edges because it's not the finished article, but it does mean that you get an opportunity to comment. Um, uh, I think sometimes in the past at these scrutiny meetings, officers have felt a bit nervous about bringing stuff that isn't quite finished um, for fear of criticism. But if, it, that's an, if that's something that's accepted by the scrutiny group, that you get inf you're getting information that's maybe not quite there, then I'm more than happy for that to... Uh, bring brought forward. Any uh, comments from <clears throat> from members on the older persons accommodation program, Councillor Pavlovich? I think that final point. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think that final point that you've made there, Tom, about about us recognising that if we want to have the opportunity to look at policy as it's being developed. Um, we do have to acknowledge that it's not necessarily going to be fully formed, but that that is, to some extent, what the purpose of this type of committee is for, to have that opportunity to be able to input um, and to discuss the ideas that um, the officers are, are trying to put together um, for presentation to executive as a fully formed document. So... 
certainly from my perspective, I, I, I would um, I would welcome it and and, and would acknowledge that um, there will be times when um, we don't have necessarily the whole picture, but that what we have got will be um, will be something that we can actually influence. Um, and I think that that is a very welcome change of, of how scrutiny is going to work um, over the next four years. Um, but just on the um, on, on that topic um, of the work that um, Vicky's doing, is it going to be looking at the overall strategy um, around older people's accommodation? We, we, to some extent, already know that there is a gap in, for example, residential um, care provision compared to need, um, and how the city hopes to be able to meet that gap. Um, yes, the intention is to look at the, look at the overall position for the city, so it will be a strategic document in that sense. Okay. <clears throat> Any other comments or observations on Councillor Baker? Thank you. Um, so, yes, in this exploration of the views of residents, um, I understand that there'll be a higher level of strategy involved in that report that she's preparing. But um, I just wondered, are things like the food provision within these homes, are those kind of daily services and the provisions going to be looked at as well because I know that the, food, the lunchtime meal services in some of these homes is currently in a state of um, flux and I just wondered whether food will be included. So are you talking about residential care homes or are you talking about sheltered or independent living schemes? Uh, um, I'm not entirely sure but I know that Marjorie Waitcourt yeah. is one of the ones that is okay. looking at new food yeah. options. Yeah. So, so Marjorie Waite is an independent living scheme at the moment. Um, historically, um, there was a situation where Meals on Wheels were provided to people and then the adult social care team just saw that as a, an area that they were cutting and there was a need for us to look at an alternative way of delivering that. The alternative way in which that's delivered is a contract between the individuals and the people that provide the food. We've tried to facilitate it. We're conscious of the fact that the, the quality is not very good and we are looking at other ways in which we might commission that. But I need to stress that the, uh, um, the what were called sheltered schemes are now called independent living schemes. They are, people are living independently, they have their own council tenancy, they're not like residential care homes. Um, and, and so there is an expectation that people will uh, cook their own food. Um, the extra care schemes that we're trying to develop are intended to be something more than just independent living because the intention is for those to actually be able to accommodate people with issues around dementia, etc. That and so uh, um, we do need to look at issues around food. Um, they've still got their own tenancy, so they're still independent. But if you think that people have got dementia or early onset dementia, we do need to think about the offer that we're providing in those schemes, mm -hmm. and we do need to try and look at it in a different way from the way in which we had before and I suppose my answer to your actual question is yes it can be included in, in the review okay thank you any other comments or questions on older persons accommodation Councillor Vassi thank you chair yes uh, just reading the report a, a, a query um, most of the report you're setting out the report sets out facts and figures and numbers of people but I'm a little confused because uh, I'm not aware of all these figures. Um, it, it refers to the number of people uh, in the city with dementia being expected to have increased by 59% by 2030. But there isn't an indication of the number of people who are suffering from dementia at the moment in the city. And I just want to try and get a grip on, on what that says. Is there, is there a, a figure? 
Thank you. I'd have to come back to you with those figures, but I mean, obviously, the report sets out that uh, you've got a population that's growing to uh, uh, 25,000 by 2030, and if that, um, uh, if you were to uh, take a percentage of that, then you could probably get to the figure. But I'd have to come back to you. I don't have it yep. immediately. <clears throat> no, that, that, that's fine. If you can, that'd be great. Okay, moving but on. You, if, you're, if you're intending to have Vicky back to the next meeting, you can ask her the question. All right. I won't, I won't tell her that you've asked, so it comes as a surprise. <laughs> Me either. <laughs> okay, uh, moving on. Housing delivery. Uh, so this is um, this is linked, I guess, with the older persons accommodation program. The city council has embarked on a, a significant house building program uh, at the end of the last administration, and obviously most of the actual delivery of this will start during this administration. Um, so over the next five years, we've identified initially eight sites that the council owns that are in the general fund and the intention is that those the, the, those sites will be transferred to the housing revenue account and we will use the housing revenue account to develop those sites out. Um, uh, uh, the intention is that we will deliver at uh, higher than what is required under planning gain We'd be looking to deliver at 40% affordable, whereas on brownfield sites across the city, private developers would be expected to deliver on the basis of 20% uh, affordable housing. Of the 40% affordable housing, 50% of that 40%, if you see what I mean, will be for social rent. The other 50% is likely to be for shared ownership or another form of uh, affordable home ownership product. Um, this is quite an exciting time. We're looking at building over 650 homes over the, the next five years. The uh, last time the council had any house building program of that size was early 70s. So that gives you some indication of um, the size of the program. And the council is looking at an investment of about 150 million over the next five years. So the department, as I said at the start, is going through quite an exciting time in terms of change and, you know, the level of investment. Um, and, and obviously the scrutiny group have an opportunity to influence some of those things. Um, I think one of the key things for you in terms of this area that you may want to look at is that we're obviously on the, embarking on the start of this journey but we are looking at um, putting in place a, a, a design guide that will influence the way in which we develop out the sites generally, that will give you, give members and the public more widely a clear idea of the type of product that we're trying to produce. Uh, um, and that is, will be going to uh, the exec in September. Um, I discussed with Stephen that that might be another topic for Jan July. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think if <clears throat> I think if we can take advantage of the time scale that those kind of pieces of work are going to and be quite nimble, and if we could spend some time at the next meeting understanding the design guide, trying to influence it as best we can, um, that I think would be probably a, a good use of our time. Um, just one question, if I may, on that section, where under key issues for the next 12 months, the first bullet talks about developing a new public consultation strategy. What would that consultation be on? Just keep it on. <laughs> Leave it on. <laughs> um, it will be... It will be basically a clear guide on how we intend to consult on all the various sites in terms of the delivery. So from the point of when we're building up the scheme to through to planning, uh, you know, obviously a private developer will do what they are required to do in terms of consultation. We want to make sure that we're consulting at an earlier stage 
and ensuring that people, it, the community itself around that are much more informed about, if they want to be, about what we're trying to deliver. Mm -hmm. Councillor Pavlovich. Thank you, Chair. Um, in respect of housing delivery, we have an indication of um, the numbers of older persons accommodation that we're going to have to create. So there's an assessment of need, if you like. Um, has there been an assessment of need of how much social housing we're going to require? We, we know, for example, what the housing waiting list is. Um, it's a strategic market, strategic housing market assessment that, that gives you the information around what the levels of affordable housing that are required. So I don't have the numbers off the top of my head. Five hundred seventy-three a year. But um, are, are we then looking at how our social housing program is going to meet that need? Has has that work been done? Well, we know what the need is. Um, I think, uh, Michael, the issue for us is having the land available, available to us to deliver that. And uh, that's the biggest issue in York. So it's all right knowing what we need, but we know that, for example, under the current situation in terms of land available to us and to the housing associations in the city, we will not hit that number. So it's rather a technical uh, issue in the sense that I'm not going to be able to deliver on it, even though I know it. So we're doing the best with what we've got. Mm -hmm. Any other <coughs> comments on, on housing delivery, Councillor Vassley? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I note with interest uh, what you've said about a design guide being put forward, and it makes me think back to uh, March when the council voted unanimously, I understand, to declare a climate emergency. And I think this would represent a perfect opportunity to have some input to make sure that whatever is built lives up to the ambition that's been declared by political, all the political parties. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'd welcome uh, the scrutiny getting engaged in that process. Okay. Any other comments on housing delivery? No. Okay, housing ICT programme. All right. Well, I won't, because you've got to be a bit geeky to <laughs> want to talk about this, but um, uh, this is quite a significant programme of work in terms of the way in which the service is delivered to customers. Um, you know, the, the delivery of the ICT programme is scheduled for to be done over the next 18 months. Obviously, I know that, you know, um, public sector ICT programmes don't always go to plan. Um, however, this one has been well resourced and uh, um, uh, is on target at the moment to deliver. Um, it will provide a, 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 a self-service to, to the customer in terms of uh, various elements of their tenancy matters. It also has a workflow system that will drive where the office's work goes in terms of driving out more efficiency. Uh, um, it has a mobile element to it, so there will be apps available that people will be able to have on their phones or tablets or whatever that, that will be interactive and not just information giving. Uh, um, and that mobile technology is also obviously available to officers and will be simple to use, so it would be possible for any member of council staff, had they got the app on, to be able to order something for a customer. So if you think about it, not only housing staff and building services staff are going into people's homes, social workers, etc. If they had the app, they could do the work for, etc., etc. So it potentially has the it is significant in that it will not only drive out the effectiveness of the service, but it will also uh, um, 
give the customer a much better experience in terms of the way in which it, we, we deliver our services. Okay. So any I'll questions stop or, there. If yeah, there I'd no, be surprised if there are any questions. Just geeky enough. Yeah. Oh, that was fine. Um, any questions or comments on any of that? That sounds good. If we now move to the additional paper yeah, sure. um, and go to page 10, right. <clears throat> and we'll pick so, up with um, housing services. Okay, so this is one area, but it's split into different teams, okay? The housing service is sort of, uh, um, well, people are located in a number of places, a large proportion of them are here, quite a sizable number are working out of our um, resettlement hostels and homeless accommodation. So I guess to some extent the housing service, inverted commas, is what you think of as a housing service. The housing service in York is a bit different from others in that we provide a comprehens comprehensive range of services that many, of, many authorities have either farmed out or uh, uh, have transferred their stock, etc., etc. This authority has not done any of that, and so the services are all provided in house. So, if we look at the first state area, it's the uh, housing standards and adaptations team. That team is, I guess, to some extent, you might call the private sector team. So, they deliver all the adaptations, not surprisingly, given that's in the title. Uh, to both council and private addresses across the city. Those adaptations can be as simple as grab rail up to a two-storey extension. Uh, um, the uh, uh, service also is heavily involved in energy efficiency and bidding for money for, from the lease city reason and for the time being from the European Union. Um, uh, uh, and uh, so we, we work with Harrogate, Selby and Craven, who are part of the Lee City region, to uh, put bids into the wider Better Homes Lee City region consortium, and we get money in from there. Mm -hmm. We're also being quite active in terms of um, doing a, a form of stock condition on the private sector a couple of years ago with the, the Building Research Camp establishment, which identified some of the key sort of issues around falls and standards within homes. And so we developed with the Better Care Fund the Falls program, which is quite innovative, where we've got people join a, a joiner and a OT going out and visiting people. And if we can fit the adaptation, on that first point of visit, we do it there and then. So we're delivering this. We're also advising customers when we're out there on other issues that may impact on their lives in terms of loneliness, etc., etc. So we're trying, trying to provide a more comprehensive service, trying to deliver some of the services that maybe historically might have been delivered by adult social care, but those are not not necessarily there anymore. Um, so I guess. In terms of this area, the two key areas that I think for, for us are around uh, uh, houses in multiple occupation and issues around tackling po fuel poverty and energy efficiency. And I guess potentially how we might better use assisted technology more to support people in their homes. Mm -hmm. uh, um, okay. Um, I appreciate members haven't had a chance to, to read and digest this, but from what you've seen, are there any questions or comments you want to raise? I'll start with one, if I may. In, in terms of the implementation of mandatory HMO licensing, where are we on the journey in terms of a, a proportion have been licensed? What, what kind of timescale are we looking at for, for completing the... The so, so the the government introduced the extent, extension to uh, licensing for homes in multiple occupation, uh, and the legislation came into force last October. So, we've only had about 
uh, seven, eight months of work on that. Mm -hmm. I think there's something in the... Re I don't know whether it's actually in the report, but... Um, uh, it, uh, a thousand, yeah, new mm -hmm. HMOs. Um, that is not uh, all of the HMOs in the city, that, but that is a significant number. And we, at the time when we introduced this, said that we would revisit the whole idea of a sort of mandatory uh, licensing in the city at a stage once we we gathered more information about what was going to happen around the licensing of these extra thousand. I think that I think the issue for us is that if you are to introduce a mandatory system you've got to be able to demonstrate that there is a, a need for that. So you've got to be able to demonstrate there's a big enough problem in the city that you need to license all the HMOs. If you can't do that, you'll be open to challenge by the landlords. And so that is something that historically we've never really been able to uh, give that uh, uh, evidence, if you like, to that. Obviously with us extending the licensing by a thousand properties, we may well find that we've got better, better information in terms of what we think may be out there in terms of concerns. And if that is something that we can come forward with, then obviously we will look at that. Any comments on standards and adaptations, Councillor Pavlovich? Just on that um, on that topic, um, do you think it it may be worthwhile for us at some time um, in the future to have a, a, a really detailed report as to how the how the licensing program has gone and what? issues have been identified in respect of um, enforcement and standards of the HMOs around the city that, that, that we have now added to um, our database. Yeah. It, 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 I think it would be helpful information to have um, just to, for us to have a better understanding of, of what, is being, what is being found as a result of the work that Officers, officers are doing. Tom, do you think that would be feasible to...? Yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, I think you might want to think about maybe looking at it maybe on the anniversary of this, so October, November time. Yeah. I was thinking more towards the end of the year. Yeah, yeah. Um, when, when we can then look at the information that you've managed to gather in respect mm. of how that will then focus on policy um, as to whether there is any evidence as to whether um, a, a more wider um, selective um, licensing scheme may be, uh, may be something that we can be um, recommending. Yeah. It's always good to have a look at what the evidence is and see where it, it might lead us. Okay. Um, if we move on to housing options and support okay. as the next batch. So, you have the housing options and support team. This is the team that basically uh, manages the homeless issues in the city. And uh, um, so, uh, you have a housing options team that are the front end team that will assess people as to whether they're statutory homeless or not. Um, we have the approach that we take in the city is very much of, around how we can prevent homelessness rather than. Uh, uh, to have a reactive service, so a large amount of resources is is channeled into preventing homeless, trying to avoid having to take a presentation. Um, you have the housing registrations team, which manage the waiting list and also work with housing associations. We're currently in a North Yorkshire Home Choice uh, uh, Choice Based Letting Scheme. We, under the last administration, with the replacement of the ICT, it was agreed that we would leave that, that scheme um, when we have the IT in place to do that. So that won't happen until 18 months' time. But the intention is for us to leave the choice-based letting scheme. It's not effective for us in this city where the, uh, um, the, the, the demand for um, social housing is such that within the policy you're servicing 
a significant number of people that will never get a council property who are in bronze band. So why are you why are you allowing them to go on the waiting list just to stay on the waiting list, just to ring you up every two or three months and say, why haven't I progressed? Well, you haven't progressed because you haven't got housing need. So we, that was one of the clear reasons why we were looking at the fact that we didn't see any sense in keeping a bronze band per se. We would still maintain a bronze band where there may be an opportunity such as sheltered or independent living schemes, but generally you wouldn't use the, the people in York were, are largely going to only get a council home if they're in gold band, whereas in other parts of the county that isn't the case. So uh, um, I think our view was that we should, we should be more honest with people about that. Um, the other areas of the services are around the temporary accommodation for people, which is those people that are going through emergency temporary accommodation. These are the people that are the largest part of the homeless service. I think some people look at people, people in door, door, shop doorways and see the rough sleepers and think that that's homelessness. The vast majority of the people that go through our homeless service have uh, have, have never slept rough in their life but have come on hard times for one reason or other and we have an obligation to them because of some vulnerability or other, other and that our main accommodation there at the moment is Holgate, Ordnance Lane, Holgate Road and Crombie House however as Stephen alluded to we have a brand new hostel being built at the moment um, 72 70, 57 unit uh, scheme at James House, which is not unsurprisingly on James Street. Um, and uh, so that is due to come off site in August, early September. And so um, that's quite exciting for us. Um, so I guess the key things there here are there are always issues around homelessness. There are always issues around uh, uh, rough sleeping. Uh, that tends to be the media focus in terms of uh, uh, um, the issues around homelessness. We have a street count every November, November the 23rd, when uh, we do a, a annual street count that then informs what the numbers of rough sleepers are officially for the year. The year before last they were 28 or 29 and last year they came down to 9. So we've invested quite significantly in additional resources in that area over the last 18 months and hopefully that has mm. paid off in terms of the numbers. That, mm. um, so I'll stop okay. there. Okay. Um, I think just one observation from me. I think the <clears throat> the report sets out some of the things that are in train in terms of James House and um, additional resources to um, tackle rough sleeping. And there may be something for us to do as a committee in terms of looking at the potential impact that that, that investment has had. Um, so, it, in, so it may be something we need to look at, not immediately, but in the not too distant future. Are there any other comments or questions members have got? Councillor Vassi? Thank you, Chair. Yes, I, I'm just minded looking at all of this that there's one fleeting reference to young people and, and it may be the time not up and running on this but with the James House temporary accommodation, there will be 57 units. Uh, you mentioned that a lot of rough sleeping is not out on the street. Homelessness is not out on the street. Um, we know young people with mental health issues are sofa hopping and an invisible uh, in many ways, to local authorities. Are you comfortable that we're doing enough in that area? Is that an area we where have, you think uh, we might need to do more? We have a pathway for young people, which includes the Howe Hill Hostel that's on um, uh, Avon Road, I think it is. Yeah. Um, that is... Um, that Those young people, they don't tend to be looked after 
young people, they tend to be people that have had a, a relationship breakdown with their parents and whatnot. 16, 17 year olds who take up to 21 year olds into Howe Hill. And that, that is the start of the pathway for young people through to independent living. Um, it's proved incredibly successful over the last eight or nine years since we've had that service. Prior to that, they were going through the uh, 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 emergency temporary accommodation rather than a planned route, and 75% of the young people were failing in the first 12 months. Now about 90% has been successful in sustaining their tenancy when they get one. So I'm satisfied that that's an area that we have covered at the moment. Uh, uh, the area that we don't have covered that we need to do more work on is creating a genuine pathway into uh, independent living for people with mental health problems. Um, and that is something that we're working with TEAS, TUV and uh, uh, adult social care to try and deliver on an alternative way of delivering for those people with complex needs um, that are either sleeping rough or are in some of our hostel accommodation which is unsuitable for them at the moment. So that is something, that is a, it's not written down here, but that is something that we are looking at, trying to create that pathway, which I think is generally recognised by professionals in housing, uh, uh, adult social care and the health authority as something that the city likes. Mm -hmm. But it ain't cheap. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> Moving on. We're nearly there. Um, housing equalities and engagement. Yeah, so... Historically, we've had a rather traditional way of engaging with our, our tenants. Um, we, we still have some residence groups, but as you can see, we have another, a number of other ways in which we work with our, our tenants to, to determine uh, whether or not our services are up to scratch. So we have the tenant scrutiny panel. So we have our own, our own scrutiny panel for tenants. Uh, um, uh, uh, we have service inspectors that go out and look at some of the different ways in which we deliver our service and uh, they're obviously briefed on the standards that we would expect and so they are there to challenge. Uh, we have a le leaseholder scrutiny panel, Those that is obviously uh, our ex-council tenants who have put, exercised the right to buy on their flats. Um, and then we have an equalities group and a performance panel. And then we obviously have the established residence associations. So those are the different methods in which uh, uh, that service is delivered. I guess um, some of the key things moving forward for that is um, uh, reviewing our engagement strategy and action plan. That's something maybe the scrutiny group might want to look at. It may be that the scrutiny, this scrutiny uh, uh, committee may want to invite tenants to attend on some occasions to get some kind of view of the service that's being delivered generally. Obviously it's just purely as far as the council tenancies are concerned, they're not yeah. the customers of all our <coughs> services. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, and I guess one of the other areas which is a bit contentious and some people who are new to, new councillors may not be familiar, but to some of the people who have been a, on the previous council, we did check, we did fund some environmental improvements in areas, and we changed the way in which we did that over the last administration. And I think it's fair to say that some members weren't happy with the way in which that was delivered. So we're going to need to look at the way in which we do that in future. Okay. <clears throat> so Any initial comments there. or observations on on the engagement piece? Councillor Pavlovich? I do think we... Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I do think we need to look at how some of these processes work and where the gaps in provision are. So, for example, with the Housing Environment um, Improvement Programme, and I know that you've mentioned that, um, only works if you're talking about a large number of council tenants um, when 
you sometimes have very specific needs um, that don't even get considered because it doesn't cover enough um, of a street or it doesn't cover enough of an area. Um, but nobody else will take it on and there's no other funding stream. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we do need to look at, at, at where the gaps in our provision are, or how the service could be improved mm -hmm. to actually meet the needs of mm -hmm. the individuals. Well, the, that, that, that money that was made available to people is obviously money that comes from the housing revenue account. Yeah. And obviously we have to reflect doing environmental improvement work that will improve things for council tenants. So you can't go using that money to build a swimming pool in an area where there isn't any council tenants because yeah. it's council rent money. And so I think that's where some of the frustration lies <coughs> with members. Equally, it lies with officers because what we've tried to do with the the heat money, as it's called, we try to combine it with ward money so that we could provide a larger pot of money. Um, but I, I do think that that programme needs further refinement, and that might yeah. be something that the scrutiny that the scrutiny group may want to have a comment on in yeah. terms of its development. I think maybe. Along, you know, looking <clears throat> at the functioning of ward committees and ward funding, it, the two are interlinked. I know, in my experience, we have tried to mesh them together as best we can. And then, well, I give you a bit of money here, and you give me a bit of money there. Uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I think it's it's some, just, in some areas it has worked, in other areas it hasn't worked, yeah, and yeah. reasons for that are various. Um, okay. Any further questions on the engagement piece? If not, if we move on to housing management. Okay, so the housing management service is basically the people who manage our council stock. So within the city we've got about 7,500 homes and we restructured the service about 12 months ago to create a situation where we put more investment into people, the staff that were in the front line. Um, so we went from 18 house, estate managers to 29 housing officers and the idea is that they have a much smaller patch and they look at uh, the issues that relate to that household rather than just tenancy matters so it's a bit like what I was saying around the uh, uh, occupational therapist and the joiner going out and saying uh, telling people about stuff that isn't necessarily housing related um, so that's that's a journey we're on at the moment because obviously we, we, we converted a number of people's jobs from office space to being out and interacting with people in their homes. And so there is a large training program going on to get people to the point where they're delivering the vision that we expected. And that's work in progress at the moment. Uh, we are getting there, but it is taking some time. Um, so um, there are always a number of issues in relation to this area of service. Um, it's a, um, obviously um, there's issues around people's income and and, and uh, poverty and, and rent arrears and how we tackle things such as that. Um, obviously this area will be heavily impacted by the new IT systems as well. Um, there are some issues around how we implement what we intend to do around visiting people in terms of not specifically on issues but targeting maybe people who are vulnerable. That will be informed by the IT system because we will have better profiling information so we will be able to say right instead of doing annual visits on every tenant maybe we should be doing annual visits on those people who have who are, who are more more at risk for whether whether that's because they're a risk to themselves or a risk to others. Um, so it's about trying to target that resource better. Yeah. So these are the guys that manage people's rent accounts. They deal with people's transfers. They deal with low-level antisocial behaviour. Um, they deal with direct exchanges, house house inspections, boundary disputes. They're the ones that you go to 
broadly speaking, if you've got a council tenant that's got a problem. Okay. Any comments or observations on on that? Again, maybe another group it might be helpful for us to engage with, whether <coughs> it's going out on a, um, a, a shadowing visit just to see the, the, the breadth of the issues that um, they are involved in. And it seems quite a... Again, it's a kind of person-centred approach rather than thinking of the the dwelling, but the people that that live there, which seems positive. Okay, finally, um, housing policy and strategy. Right, so as part of the restructure of the housing delivery and development team, we re also recreated our housing policy and strategy team. Um, these are the people that will respond to consultation from government office on any white paper or things like that. These are the people that will look at things such as our uh, asset management strategy, our housing revenue account, business plan, um, any other strategy that they work on with the, some of the other staff around the homeless strategy uh, and other policy documents. Um, I guess in terms of the areas of work that may be of, of interest or uh, consequence to the, the scrutiny uh, uh, committee is we are reviewing our housing revenue account business plan. That will inform the way forward in terms of the next five years around how we invest money. The, the, the financial element of that was reviewed before the election. However, we do need to look at the words that are in the business plan, so that may be an area that uh, you may want to look at. Alongside that, we do need to review our asset management strategy. So this is about um, how, how we make decisions around our assets, around the, the, the bricks and mortar, uh, whether or not, for example, we sell or demolish a council house because of the level of investment it might need to put it right. You know, we've had individual properties, not necessarily a state base, but individual properties around the city where we've had to potentially look at uh, whether we're going to invest £150,000 on structural work or are we going to flog it. Um, and so, for example, we had a property in Bishopthorpe Road where we had exactly that issue and instead we decided that we would put it on the market and we realised £500,000 on that one property because it was on Bishopthorpe Road, even though it needed £150,000 worth of structural work. So that money can then be invested back into our housing development programme. Um, so there are times where, like, much as it may pain you to sell assets, it may be that that asset is worth more in terms of the monetary value to reinvest in a new property that may cost you a unit cost of 150,000, but 500,000 you're going to get three homes for the price of one. So in those circumstances. So we are looking at our asset strategy and looking to improve that, and that may be another area of interest. Um, okay. uh, I'll stop there. That's gonna, fine. I think I'm going to get hoarse in a minute. But I'm sorry, you, you, <coughs> sorry, Ernie Corn. I suppose the, the one thing that I noticed was we, we talked earlier about um, the situation in York in terms of the availability of land and the demand for... Um, social housing. I was, it was interesting to see um, bottom of page eight, 18 as one of the key issues, researching best practice examples from other authorities um, working in similar high value, high demand areas. Mm. That struck me as being particularly interesting and I don't know if there's any um, anything we can do as a scrutiny committee to to, to have some involvement in that or at least better understand? I mean, you could always uh, invite the officers to come and talk to you about the whole wider issue of the housing market in York and yeah. what, is the, what, what are the challenges that we face and are, what are people's ideas about how we can uh, improve that situation. I mean, that would be quite an interesting debate, I guess. Do members feel that would be... I mean, 
suppose trying to develop an understanding of the nature of the problem to help inform what the potential solutions might be. Mm. Mm. Kind of I mean, vague nods, yeah. <laughs> no one's shaking their head, so. <laughs> Any other comments or observations on, on that last bit? Councillor Pavlovich. Uh, I do think, Chair, it seems as this is possibly the single biggest factor um, that we as a, as a local authority and the biggest challenge that we have about meeting the need for um, housing within the city. If we do look at this, that we don't have it as part of a packed agenda, yes. um, because I think it's probably going to end up taking um, quite a long time to discover it, particularly if we're having reports from officers as well, because I think it's just such a wide-ranging topic if you're talking about housing need, housing availability, um, house prices, examples from other areas, how we work with housing associations, and I would certainly recommend that we invite some of the housing associations to come in and talk to us about the challenges that they face, mm -hmm. um, that it's just one, um, one big um, one agenda general. item. Thank you. No, I think that would, that would make sense, and we can <clears throat> liaise with officers to make sure that we set a date for that where we can get the relevant individuals involved. What I'd like to do now, whilst Tom is still at the table, um, we, we talked around some of the issues we would like to bring to future meetings. So whilst we've got Tom there, if I play back what, what I think we said we would like to bring back um, to future meetings, if you turn to page 39 of your main... Um, main document pack um, 22nd of July we've got the only substantive item currently on here is year end finance and performance monitor um, which is a backward look and there's, it's really for us to be aware of and to note I think we are due to have <clears throat> the executive member um, for housing coming to that meeting for us to to meet her and ask any questions. So that's <clears throat> that's one agenda item. Um, I made a note of the, the design brief, picking up the comments made around trying to influence that, particularly from a sustainability perspective, but in terms of other other aspects as well. Is that is that likely to be a, a, a feasible from your perspective, Tom? Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I, as long as Michael's not on holiday or uh, whatever, but uh, I'm sure <laughs> someone else will be able to do it. Okay. Um, given that I think you mentioned that was planning, the plan is for that to go to executive in September. Yeah, so yeah. Okay. Um, it would be opportune for you to okay. um, have some involvement <clears throat> in that. Yeah. Um, Could we also I, fit in to July um, an agenda item on older older person's accommodation programme, given yeah. the work you ref referred to that Vicky Japes was leading on this more holistic mm -hmm. view of yeah. not just simply housing need, but, but a broader piece that she was, you've commissioned some work well, on. I've checked her diary, she's still at work. So. All right. <laughs> okay. So that, for July, that seems fairly, <clears throat> some interesting stuff from a policy perspective. We can hopefully... Um, have some input into. You mentioned the housing revenue account business plan, which is another piece of mm. policy development. When would it make sense for us to have a look at that? I would suggest either August or September. <clears throat> okay. We don't have an August meeting, so that'll be September then. Um, we talked about HMO licensing, and I think Councillor Pavlovich suggested sort of December. Um, yeah, um, given the, um, it'd be the past the first anniversary of the new system coming in. So we say January? Um, yeah. January? Yeah. Um, which would suggest, in terms of picking up the, the, the point about having a, a, a more deep dive on um, <clears throat> housing needs and availability, uh, looking at October or November. October, we've got um, Surf York Partnership 
uh, report. November, we currently have nothing. Um, you don't have to have say for your partnership if you don't want to. Um, you could have them come and talk about something a bit more interesting than just reporting on their yeah. their sort of biannual report on community safety. You might want okay. to have them come and talk about how we're tackling county lines or counter terrorism. Councillor Pavlovich. Could I suggest, therefore, Chair, that? We invite them um, and perhaps the police and um, other organisations to come and talk to us about county lines, given that it is such a significant factor yeah. and how the authority um, is addressing it both within neighbourhoods um, and for those individuals that are perhaps vulnerable and um, affected by being exploited. Okay. So if we so make... We could have it almost yeah. as a round table discussion about what's 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 happening within that so if we aim to do that for that october meeting um and then the 25th of november meeting try and have that as our housing need availability again similar if we get the key players similar round table discussion um, <coughs> to get a bit of a deep dive into that so, <clears throat> so just to confirm uh, the um the discussion with um partners with the police around county lines, that would be more an evidence session rather than a report coming. Um, of, of course, a cover report could be presented just to say how we got to this meeting happening, but actually they don't have to produce a report. They'll be here for more of an evidence session or? Well, I think, I think absolutely, but I do think that there is a report that's required about how we work within areas that are impacted by county lines and what the authority is doing because as, you, as Tom quite rightly pointed out a lot of these areas are in, in, in areas that there are um, council houses and in, in, in the areas that there aren't how are we then um, supporting individuals and the communities that are impacted by it. Mm -hmm. um, as we know we've just had a, a significant issue um, in the Nunnery Lane area um, and you know, I think that that's quite a good example of how the authority can be proactive. Um, so I, I think a report, but also a discussion and some evidence gathering. Yeah, I think in terms of a report setting out the nature of the issue, the, the, the work the council has done, um, and take it from there. Um, I think that's, that's, I think we've got a good place to start. I'm, I'm not going to make you go through all of the things you've heard, which I'm sure you're still absorbing, and potentially come up with um, scrutiny topics. What I will do, I'll circulate by email um, this helpful thing, which is a scrutiny registration form. Um, if you think about what you've heard and some of the issues that have been raised, this I found quite useful. It helps guide... You've got an idea for a scrutiny topic, and it kind of takes you through... What's the ambition? What's the remit? Um, you know, how, how might it improve efficiency or performance? What will be different as a result? Um, I'll go through all the things I've listened to, and if you can do similarly, um, and we can, so by email, we can try and pull some ideas together. So in, the work we do in between meetings is often more important than the work we do actually in the meetings to try and... Um, keep in touch between meetings and sort of share ideas of potential discrete scrutiny topics as well as some of the more policy development um, topics we can focus on in these meetings. Um, I, I know we've been very much been in receive mode today, but I think that's been helpful and necessary, I think, for us to get a, um, a good understanding of the, of the breadth of um, the service area that we're looking at, which I have to admit is broader than... I initially <laughs> thought it would be, um, but I think that's that's a good thing, and it gives us plenty of um, uh, room to work in. Tom, is there anything you want to add before we let you disappear? No. No. <laughs> Which is why I turned the mic off. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for coming and for uh, um, for giving us uh, your time and your your insight. Um, so that's agenda item four. We've kind of already done agenda item five, which is the work plan. I will 
ask David to explain a little bit about forward plan and going forward how we can, as a committee, we can keep abreast of what's coming up on the council's forward plan um, so that we, we make sure we don't miss anything. Thank you. You could have asked Tom to, to explain the forward no, plan even you. better. Um, <clears throat> well, the forward plan are just um, decisions that are going to come to executive, and I think Tom alluded to some of the issues um, uh, that um, are going to go forward to the, fo uh, to the executive in subsequent months. Normally, they're put on uh, three uh, months, uh, three month period. Chris does a lot of that work. Um, there hasn't been so much um, activity at the moment in the housing, but as Tom said, that's going to all start to pick up. And there's going to be a meeting with the chairs um, in the 1st of July where uh, how we perhaps have a clearer approach, a more um, yeah, I think concerted they, approach. Yeah. Although what we've discussed initially was to perhaps um, brief the chairs and the vice chairs. But what you can also do as members, you can uh, register to get updates via the... You can't do that anymore? Uh, you should already receive them. As, every time I add anything to the full plan, you should all get an email saying, so, new items on the full plan this week. Check your junk folder. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, thank so you. you're so, actually um, actually already um, registered. I had to register, yeah. but uh, as members, yeah. you are registered. So I think that the, the, the takeaway is that we'll keep an eye on the forward plan, so we make sure that if anything is coming on the forward plan that relates to this service area, that we're aware of it, and we have the opportunity to say we want to talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. right. And uh, would they also have access to officer decisions uh, as yeah. well, yeah. or do they have to register for those? That's probably a that's another Different. question. That's, I mean, they're published on the council website, yeah. um, but we can, we'll, we'll have a chat about what, what, what processes we need to look, keep an eye on officer decisions to see what we need to do with those. But because they're, they're, they've happened, um, that will be a retrospective look. But yeah. that's something we can probably go on, Chris. I, I, I need just to say that that's the bonus of having Tom and having your briefings with him is that he, he puts you in the picture in that, in that sense and says, oh, yeah. these are the things that are coming up in the next 12 months. This is what you can stay abreast of. Right, that's, yeah. that's where he's yeah. in, invaluable. Okay. Is there any urgent business? So just one thing about the work plan. <laughs> uh, as I mentioned in the briefing, um, <clears throat> it's just the council, the full council next year so the, all our committee meetings fall before the full council. Uh, there's been a need to ask for uh, the uh, 27th of April meeting to be moved to the 20th, uh, and for a May meeting, which is not on the work plan, but to be added to the work plan, to be on the 18th of May. If we can approve that. Fine by me. That's uh, the only business. Okay. So I declare the meeting closed. Thank you very much and enjoy what's left of your evenings.